Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Hello and welcome to this virtual event hosted by the Commonwealth of California. Uh, my name is Andrew Dudley and I am the chair of the Forum People and Nature. And today we're extremely honoured to have a, our guest, uh, Eugene Linden, an award-winning investigative journalist and um, uh, more recently an author of Fire and Flood, a People's History of the Climate Change from 1979 to Present. Welcome, Linden. Uh, very happy to be here. How are you doing? Very, very well. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Now, before we discuss the book, uh, you've been covering the climate crisis or climate change since the 1980s. So what prompted your interest in, in the earliest article you wrote, which I believe was in 1988? And what was the feedback? Um, well, I, I started looking at climate when, when I'd been following it actually earlier than that, but I started writing about it. I mean, what, once you understand climate is the context for all human activities, you know, you can have a climate that's hospitable for humans and the climate that's not hospitable for humans. And the danger was we were creating a self-inflicted wound, creating a climate that might not be as hospitable for humans as the climate of the last 10,000 years, which has been the sweet spot for humanity. Numbers having grown from 5 million to now 7.8 billion. Um, and uh, it's uh, the, the climate we've had called the Holocene is a rarity. In other words, it's not something that comes along often. I mean, it's a product of orbital dynamics and a whole lot of things. Um, and it's, it's been good to us. And so if we're messing with it, I wanted to know about it. And you, you just mentioned the Holocene. Just for those people that are familiar with that, with that word, could you briefly describe what, what that is and what it means? Well, it's, it's just the, the most recent climate era. Um, and it... Uh, began after the last, the, the, the last ice age has ended. Um, and the ice ages began about 2.7 million years ago. They were actually important for humanity as well because uh, human evolution, um, we probably wouldn't be as smart as we are today without the disruptions of the ice age because during these periods of cooling and drying, these repeated periods, the uh, specialists died out and the generalists thrived. And so, we became successively smarter. But once we got to where we are, we needed the climate as it is or as it was up until the uh, 1990s. And uh, one, uh, one of the most startling uh, the Facebook uh, posts I read was by Stefan Ramdorf, uh, who is the, uh, one of the leading climate modelers in the world out of the University of Potsdam in Germany. And uh, just a, a year ago or so, he put up a post saying, congratulations, humanity, you've left the hot Holocene. And what he meant was that temperatures had risen 1.1 degrees Celsius beyond the normal uh, variation within the Holocene for the last 10,000 years. So, so just to talk about the book very briefly is, is well, just the kind of the, the kind of influence or what, what made you write the book and what is, what is the reason for 1979? What, why have you indicated that? Well, I'll start with the, uh, the, the, the first question. Uh, uh, why did I write the book? Um, I think I was triggered, <laughs> if that's the word. I wrote an article in 1993 for Time Magazine on the insurance industry and the climate change. And back then we all thought, and I thought, that the insurance industry would turn out to be the white knight of climate change because it, would, it lives and dies by pricing risk. And if climate is a risk, um, and if they underprice it, they go out of business. And sure enough, the reinsurance side of the business did do some of the most best studies I've seen um, on the, uh, what climate might do and the economic costs of climate change. It turned out to be a very timid white knight. So fast forward to 2018 and uh, the campfire uh, with $12.5 billion in losses. And uh, the Times had an article where they quoted a leading lobbyist for the insurance industry saying, they're scrambling to understand this risk of climate change. And I thought, read that and thought, what? You've known about this risk for 25 years at that point. And not only that, done some of the best studies on it. And it raised a question in my mind. It's like, if the insurance industry is scrambling and is not reacting to climate change, even as they know it's a, a, an existential risk to their business, it, 
it bears un, uh, trying to understand why no other industries reacted as well. And, and so I decided I wanted to write a, um, a, 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 an account of how we got to where we are because my great grandchildren might peer out of their caves and wonder, you know, what, <laughs> why, how did you guys blow it? Why didn't you do anything about it? Why 1979? Well, that was the first time that the uh, issue of uh, global warming got uh, attention at the presidential level. Jimmy Carter commissioned a blue ribbon panel. The panel came back with their recommendations. And one of them said, if, if we don't deal with fossil fuel emissions, um, soon we will likely see changes in climate by the year 2000. They were off by 15 years. We began to see changes in the late, in the mid eighties and they became indisputable in the nineties. So I did, I did read the, the reports of the CEQ reports, which uh, suggested trying to limit global average temperature to two degrees above pre-industrial levels, which turns out to be precisely the standard agreed by all nations of the world 35 years later in the Paris Agreement. How, do, how does that strike you when, when you when you see that so many years later? Well, I mean, it, 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 on the one hand, it's infuriating. Um, first of all, two degrees is going to be no picnic. We're at 1.1 degrees now. And the uh, last decade saw over $3 trillion in weather-related losses. The decade before that was 1.5. So it's almost doubling every decade. Um, and that is going to continue because of the, uh, the, uh, the, the momentum, you, uh, carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases, or well, carbon dioxide stays in the, in the atmosphere for many decades, maybe as long as 100 years. So, um, and it, it raises the question, you know, of the counterfactual, what, what, what could we have done? And, I, my argument in the book is that uh, the battle was lost in the 90s, because uh, keep in mind, 1990, we're already seeing temperature changes. Um, emissions since then have risen by 60%. This is when it was already a problem in 1990. Population is up by 2.5 billion people since 1990. Um, the average number of emissions per person is globally is four tons or more. That's 10 billion tons of carbon that is now means that the rock we have to push up a much steeper hill with a much shorter timeline. Um, and so we needed to be, act back then. And back then, unfortunately, um, everybody thought we have time. It turns out we didn't have time. So in your book, you, you mentioned about Lyndon B. Johnson. He, he spoke of humans on a geophysical experiment with the atmosphere. So kind of he was kind of was he the first president to really speak out about this and and, and for Carter what what really influenced President Carter to take, take the actions that he did? Um, well, he had uh, well first of all Johnson did say that and um, he had brilliant speechwriters um, so he 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 was the he was the first president to talk about it. Um, uh, my guess is that was Dick Goodwin you know who was just incredibly eloquent um, and um, Carter I think surrounded himself with very good people. Uh, in terms of the science, in terms of the science, he was an engineer himself, as you know, a nuclear engineer, I think. Um, and so he was he was partial to it. But keep in mind that uh, at the same Carter's interest, uh, well, he was interested in climate change. He was more interested in energy independence because fresh in their minds was, of course, the o OPEC oil embargo and gas lines and everything else. Um, and so he wanted. And so at the same time, he's saying he has a blue ribbon panel saying. Um, we need to act or we're going to see climate change at that very same time. He's also vastly increasing our use of coal, but that was in the name of energy independence. So, you know, that um, he, he wasn't speaking consistently, but he did um, create tax credits and other incentives that dramatically brought down the cost of solar and wind during his period, not to grid parity, not nearly, but had that continued in the eighties, um, we would have had a, a, a uh, Reagan uh, couldn't care less about the issue, and of course uh, pulled the uh, pulled the incentives. And uh, uh, Phil Clapp, uh, 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 the late environmentalist, said set back solar by uh, solar by ten years. Um, but if we go back to the '90s again, China and India were just beginning their industrialization, particularly China. 1990, they had half our emissions, even though they had a far, far larger population. Now they have twice our emissions and are by far the biggest greenhouse gas emitter on the planet um, and have mooted all the efforts. Have been, there have been efforts by particularly the European Union and Japan and others using energy efficiency as well as renewables to kind of lower our carbon emissions. And so we've actually done a reasonable job, but it's been completely overwhelmed by the emissions of China, which is now the largest emitter in the world, and India, which is now the third largest. We're still the second. 
I understand that President Carter also fitted uh, solar panels on the West Wing. Yes, he did. Well, yeah, he did. I mean, again, I think this driven more by the issue of energy and efficient energy efficiency and energy independence than by uh, concerns. He was concerned about global warming and he did have very good people. And, uh, you know, um, if uh, had had he been reelected, um, we, we, we might we, we might not be facing what we're facing today. Mm -hmm. But the other the other issue, uh, again, in the 90s was we were telling China, you know, you got to leapfrog. You, you don't have to recapitulate the use of fossil fuels, even as we were um, pushing fossil fuels. And so we were it was a question of saying that do as we say, not as we do. And then the other part of this, of course, is we were giving a mixed message because there was well, uh, uh, this is in the 90s. Well, you know, uh, President Clinton was, you know, uh, uh, sensitive to the issue. There were many in our government who were saying, it, you know, the, the, that same issue that it's a hoax. And then the other thing that began in the 90s, which was really unfortunate, was that business uh, interests mobilized to delay any action on climate change. And they were incredibly effective. And they used a, a playbook that had been invented uh, to uh, dispute regulation on tobacco and then kind of optimized during the ozone hole issue to delay action on banning ozone holes, destroying chemicals. And then, you know, they didn't just mobilize, but they mounted a blitzkrieg in uh, the early 90s. And the playbook was dispute the science, question the motives of the scientists, say the consensus doesn't exist, and most of all, say we have time. And uh, so starting in the 90s, uh, you know, that people felt we had time. And then in the late 90s, the worst possible thing happened, which is the issue became politicized. And once an issue becomes politicized, facts don't matter. If the messenger is deemed to be illegitimate, you're not going to listen to the facts. And that's been the case ever since. So even today, um, there's a recent Gallup poll a couple of years ago showed that, you know, a, a, a large number of people don't believe that climate change will, 45% don't believe that climate change will have a serious impact in their lifetimes, even as climate change is having a serious impact. And so, you know, with, without that kind of, unity and political will, you're not going to get action. And we didn't. Exactly. So and throughout the book, you talk about the transitions between the different presidential administrations, and you also intertwine this with these, the theory of these four clocks. Could you briefly describe what, what, how that works and what that's about? Yeah, well, the, the four clocks are the device I use to tell the story of what's happened, you know, since the dawn of the climate change era, which I I, the book goes from 1979, but the climate change era really began in 1988 when it became a mainstream issue. And so I use these four clocks because it, it, it unpacks a way of understanding what exactly happened in the interaction of these different realms. The first, of course, is reality itself. And uh, that's just what's happened with climate. And of course, that's been way ahead of anybody's expectations in terms of the rapidity and the intensity of the changes even with the amount of uh, uh, loading of the atmosphere that we've done. The second clock is the scientific community. And that has a structural lag to reality of a couple of years because you have to gather data, you have to analyze it, you have to have it peer reviewed and then published, all right? The third clock is the public and that has lag, lag reality by decades. Because as I say, even today, large segments of the public don't even acknowledge that climate is changing or that there is a consensus among the scientists uh, with its consensus gelled in the nineties and it's rock solid, as, bad, as robust as any cons scientific consensus we've seen. And then the fourth clock, and it's the most underappreciated and perhaps the most important is the business and finance community. Because for the first 30 years of the climate era, they were a drag anchor on action. Um, and they're one of the main reasons we haven't done anything. Um, and I, we can talk about that, but um, in the last couple of years, there's been a sea change and it's ongoing where May, most of the, the multinationals and the large financial institutions now recognize that climate change regulation isn't the threat, it's climate change itself. And so they've, they've, they've gotten on board. Um, but I, I do uh, think that um, what I discovered was that there's a blind spot in the way we do business. Essentially, um, the momentum of business as usual um, makes it very difficult for us to integrate into our business practices long-term threats. Because, and that's why I use the insurance industry, they were incentivized to keep writing policies long after it became clear that climate was changing because businesses live and die at the retail end. Those who actually, um, those who actually bring in the business 
tend to, um, you know, tend to be uh, at the, uh, rewarded and those who don't tend to be marginalized. Let me, um, I'm going to read a sentence or two from the uh, end of chapter 18, where I say our modern market economy is so ingenious at spreading and hiding risk that its very adaptability has become a threat to its future. We're so gifted at finding the profit to harvest in every risk and pushing off the day of reckoning that as a society, we have lost the ability to recognize and adjust to true danger. Wow. And that is, that is our weak stuff. We have basically created an economy that is designed to drive off cliffs. And that has to change if we're going to address this threat. Just to step back to the scientific side of this. So, you know, obviously now it's rock solid on understanding of, of what has happened. But back in the day, if I understood it correctly, there was a, a belief that the climate wouldn't change at speed. It would take a long time to, 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 to adjust to human-based human, human uh, based influence. But you had an analogy in the book that you put forward where a code breaker is reading a letter looking for the clues only to realize that the code was contained within the micro dot on one of the full stops. Yes, that's, that's exactly right. What happened was, um, and, and you're, you're actually exactly right. In the, in the 70s and, eight, and through much of the 80s, the, the, the conventional wisdom among client sciences was that it would take decades, if not hundreds of years, if not a thousand years for climate to change, which is why it's so remarkable that that Blue Ribbon panel said we'd see changes by 2000, by the way. And the reason for that, going back to the analogy of the micro dot, was that the, the proxies we used to reconstruct past climates weren't precise enough to see the changes, the rapid changes that might occur in the past. And then in 1988, um, there, there are two major ice core drilling projects in Greenland started uh, a European and American project, took out you know, these giant two mile cores and started analyzing them. And these cores had a precise record and other proxies also came along which had a precise record. And what was revealed was that no, climate doesn't change in a stately and gradual way. It, it more likely violent and rapid shifts and seesaw patterns that are highly um, uh, volatile. And, uh, and so the old analogy was that climate change was like a dial that you slowly turned up or down. The new analogy was like a switch. And that's Richard Alley, a, a, a paleogeochemist who uses that analogy. But in any event, that realization, which when the papers were published in 1993 in, in uh, Nature and I think Science as well, um, that realization started a paradigm shift among the scientists about what the, about the nature of climate change and the realization that if we push the climate system too hard, it might go into one of these rapid shifts. And I, I think that's exactly what we're seeing right now, where climate is, is shifting, you know, uh, uh, sea level rises many times the level, uh, uh, the rate of sea level rise for the past thousand years, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so we, you know, we, we, the scientific community, um, the climate science community found itself in the process of studying a rapid climate change shift, even as they were discovering that rapid climate change. And they look up, they look up from the data and they say, oh, this is happening now also. And the last time it happened was 12,800 years ago. And the other thing you bring up in the book is that scientific rigor doesn't match short-hand journalism. Can you just describe or go, go into a bit more detail on that? Because I thought that was fascinating. In, in, in the sense that uh, uh, the, the journalists weren't really reporting on the, you know, oh, the yeah, yeah. scientific rigor. Um, well, it was it, what happened. I mean, I, I may not be answering your, I hope I'm answering your question, but um, scientists are loath to go beyond the data. Um, and, and so there's a conservatism and, uh, in science. Um, but, um, and uh, those who would delay action exploited that conservatism. Um, and, and so, for instance, in the 1990, uh, this giant, uh, the IPCC uh, first assessment of, of the state of the climate, they didn't have any data from the permafrost. Scientists knew back then that if temperatures rose, the, Antic the Arctic would likely warm faster. They'd also know that um, permafrost was likely to melt and that there were hundreds of billions of tons of greenhouse gases stored in the permafrost that might be re released. But in the first report, they couldn't mention that because there weren't any, any research stations. And so um, it, uh, it, 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 failed, you know, it failed to address that issue, which is actually becoming quite serious. Um, the other thing is, is that in journalism, um, there was a, 
tendency to what I would say call, it's called both sidesism. It was a, a tendency to, oh, whenever you made an assertion about climate, to try and find somebody who disputed it, even after the consensus was solid and rock solid. And that also led to confusion and belief that um, in the public that there wasn't a scientific consensus about human caused climate change long after there was. It was as though if uh, long after we knew could, to, cigarettes caused cancer, that anybody who asserted some new ca cancer finding, you'd have to go find somebody who'd say, no, they don't cause cancer. We don't do that. But we did it with climate change and well into the 2000s. When, when the Reagan administration came into power, that they quickly undid a lot of what President Carter was putting into motion. But at the same time, you mentioned the IPCC came into, came into being. So that, that was in, in the nature of the way it was set up, caused a lot of challenges, didn't it? You were describing that also. Right, right. I mean, uh, the IPCC was formed, I think, in 88, and um, the first report was in 1990. Um, and uh, it was meant to be, you know, the assessment of the best science. But they brought into the tent policymakers, government representatives, and in which in a group which included a lot of people who had no interest in taking action on climate change. And so while the chapters of these early reports reflected the state of the art science at the time, to, to a large degree, the executive summaries uh, introduced all sorts of hedges and things that made them the most bland reading you could imagine. Um, and the, the problem with that was once again, those who would delay action took it and run with it. And I'll give you an example. Um, an economist named William Nordhaus was trying to model the uh, economic costs of climate change, and he was using the IPC data. Um, and so he took a, one, one uh, thing, which was that uh, the, the statement that the thermal inertia of the oceans was going to dampen any signal of climate change well into the next century, uh, century and said, look, um, and came up with these absurdly low um, estimates of cost to GDP of climate change in the year 2100. So, so one of the estimates was a quarter of a percent of GDP, in other words, one percent. In other words, no one is going to go jumping out of their chair and saying, we've got to do something if 120 years later, or 110 years later, sorry, there was only going to be a quarter of a percent hit to US GDP. One of the assumptions behind those low estimates was truly absurd, which is that 87% of the US economy, he estimated, occurred indoors and thus was insulated from climate change. Well, tell that to the people of Houston uh, during Hurricane Harvey, tell that, or the, or the industries in Houston, <laughs> the industries in uh, the port of us uh, of New Orleans uh, during Katrina, or any of the businesses in the fire zone in California and Oregon during the, the, the epic fires we've had over the last few years. But in any case, once he's a distinguished scientist, he actually was given the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago for his work on climate, which sticks in my crawl. But um, he, um, William Niskanen, who was then head of the, uh, uh, the conservative economist, head of the Cato Institute, a libertarian uh, think tank, goes before Congress, cites Nordhaus's work saying, you know, it looks like the impact on the economy is gonna be very modest and uh, not much in the long run, so we have time. And, and so everything conspired to sort of delay action back then. And uh, we're living with the results now. What do you think we can learn from, or what can the global community learn from our experience with the CFC and, and the ozone layer? And, and also with the denial effect that DuPont uh, kicked in during the Reagan administration. Right, I wrote a, 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 an appraisal of, of action on that for time way back when. And what was interesting was that, um, during the Carter years, they were moving towards a ban because the, dis the discovery that CFCs, these chemicals um, used as refrigerants and other things, could cause harm ozone, atmospheric ozone, upper layer of stratospheric ozone, dates to 1974. Um, it comes out, and so Carter is moving towards a ban. Then, and, and uh, DuPont, the world's largest maker of CFCs at that point, starts research on the alternatives, expecting that the chemicals are going to be banned. The next thing that happens is Reagan's elected and uh, the CFC industry lobbyists realize Reagan's not gonna ban these chemicals. And, and so they stop, DuPont stops work on the alternatives and they, and, and they start lobbying to, to not have these chemicals banned. Then a year or two later in the early eighties, uh, Joe Farman from the British uh, uh, Antarctic Survey discovers the ozone hole. Not only were these chemicals destroying ozone, there was actually a hole in the layer the size of a continent and 
the danger, of course, as I'm sure uh, most of you know, was that without the ozone layer, um, UV, dangerous UVB radiation would hit the surface of the earth. As one NASA scientist put it, it would sterilize the planet. So this is like a life-threatening thing. Um, and, uh, but still, very disingenuously, um, they, they threw all these arguments, they, this is the industry in DuPont in particular, saying, oh, it's a mature market, it's not gonna be rising, even as they knew refrigeration was exploding internationally and these chemicals were gonna go. Any case, then NASA goes in, in um, 87, I think it was, and discovers its own, it does its own measurements and, and discovers the ozone hole, the smoking gun as it was called back then. And uh, DuPont re realized that the jig was up. And, uh, and then they supported action on banning the chemicals because they knew they had the alternative. Well, that, you know, that kind of success with climate change and you know, we're gonna be living in a sauna in 150 years um, because um, ozone with one class of cannabis if ozone was a, a mole hole, if the CFCs were a mole hole, the amount of the fossil fuel industry is Everest. And you know, it is so profuse through our economy that almost everything we do um, contributes in some way. Two billion tons of steel made each year, 8% of the emissions going up there. Concrete, another several percent. Agriculture, 10%. I mean, everything. Transportation, a huge number. So um, it was, um, what we realized or what I, I, at the end of that article, I said, gee, um, there's going to be real trouble if we, that same playbook that was used to delay action on the, on, on the oz on ozone is used with climate change. And indeed, that's exactly what's happened. And there has been real trouble. So just for our viewers, uh, if you have a question for Eugene, please feel free to uh, pop, pop it into the uh, Q&A section uh, on YouTube, and then we'll get to those in about 15 minutes. Uh, just to, uh, to, to go back to the insurance industry. So as you mentioned, you know, you thought that they were going to be the white knight of the business community and, you know, they were going to, you know, detect the risk. And you talk about the preserve, perverse incentives with the insurance industry, knowing for their accurate risk assessment should profess to have been blindsided by events its own risk assessors predicted. Are you seeing that out in, in play now in Florida and California? Yeah, well, uh I'll, let me uh, say uh, a mea culpa, you know, um, I was wrong back then and I was wrong for a couple of reasons. Um, one, I underestimated the momentum coming from the retail side of the industry. Um, and, you know, they live and die by writing policies. The second thing I was wrong about was their absolute genius at offloading and spreading risk. Uh, for one thing, insurers, um, as many in California are now discovering, they renew policies annually. And so, um, if big time fires happen, they can either try to pull out or they can try to up the price. And I've heard of premiums rising by a factor of 10 in some parts of California and, and deductibles rising by a factor of 30. That kind of thing most homeowners can't afford. Um, and so then um, the state of course put in a moratorium that only lasted a year. Then as soon as they could hightail it, they did, AIG pulled out. Um, the, the other part of this in spreading risk was um, after Hurricane Andrew in 1992, which $50 billion in losses and put about a dozen insurance companies out of business, um, the re industry realized they were picking up all this risk. Um, and then a guy named Eberhard Muller at Hanover Ray, a big reinsurance uh, company in Germany, had a brilliant idea. He, he, he created this thing called a cat bond. And what that bond is, is you buy a, that bond, you're getting a, a nice interest rate, say 8%, much higher than you get from treasuries or uh, corporates. And all you're doing is you're betting that there's not gonna be a category five hurricane hitting Miami in the next five years. So even if the odds of that hurricane hitting have doubled from one in 100 to two in 100 to one in 50, you know, you're still got 49 chances in the next three years that it's not gonna hit. And institutional investors love this bond because it's what's called as non-correlated to their other assets. In other words, if the market could fall through the floor, interest rates could go kablooey, but you'd still get your nice 8% so long as the hurricane didn't hit. And so what it did for the insurance industry was it gave them access to hundreds of billions of dollars in institutional money. Uh, they didn't have to backstop all the risks. Um, and so the combination of the incentives at the retail and in their ingenious uh, spreading risk, and also, they can pull out. 
which they did a lot of uh, in Florida. And what happened when they pull out? The state picked up the risk. The state, in other words, socialized the risk so that the, in effect, the, the, if, if, the, if the, that state entity, which became, very quickly became the largest insurer in the state, which shows you that they were underpricing risk because no private insurer would compete with them. If that goes bankrupt because of a windstorm, the, uh, the, the middle income taxpayers in the middle of the state are gonna be picking up the tab for the more wealthy people living on the coast. Um, and uh, you know something similar is happening in California with the FAIR program. But um, it, all of these things enable the insurers to either leave markets or underprice risk knowing that somebody else would pick up the risk. The net effect of all of that together is that millions of people since 1990 and since the issue became known have moved into harm's way, into the zones that are most at risk from climate change on the coast, into the fire zones in the, in the West. And indeed, Miami is like the hottest real estate market in the country at the moment. And it is one of the counties most at risk for all the aggregate effects of climate change of any counties in the country. Palm Beach County too, another old red hot real estate market. Um, and so we're setting the stage for the, a potential financial crisis that dwarfs 2008. Um, and um, I had a front row seat at that uh, crisis because I was a chief investment strategist for a hedge fund um, and watched it unfold. And, and actually we, we were involved in, 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 in trying to protect ourselves. Um, and the same, uh, something parallel could happen, something similar um, with the, uh, uh, a, a climate financial crisis that might come down the road. It too, would involve real estate and it would be triggered by people either not being able to get insurance or not being able to sell their home or not being able to get a mortgage because they can't get fire or flood insurance and things like that or wind insurance and, um, and finding that th there aren't buyers. Um, and certainly, you know, the Rhodium Group, ProPublica and the Times did a study, of, of the Rhodium Group did the study of every fifth county in the United States, countywide study, assessing them for climate risk. And, um, they had four different types of risk, they had more, uh, but they had a uh, wet bulb temperature, absolute temperature, uh, sea level rise, you know, floods, fires, um, yield, farm yields. And um, some of the wealthiest counties in the country are, when you aggregate all these risks, are, they estimate from 2040 to 2060 will become near uninhabitable. In other words, so we are teeing up a rather large financial crisis that might happen before even the worst effects of climate change are upon us. So the, the, organ, the backstop insurer uh, or state-owned insurer in Florida is Citizens Property Insurance, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So you think that the creation of an organization like that has created a false sense of security for people moving into Florida and buying property? Well, it's, it's made, yeah, it, because the pricing. Um, if you're underpricing risk, um, you're essentially providing an incentive for somebody. It's not a simple issue. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, like the Florida Keys are entirely dependent on the tourist industry. If they actually price risk for the floods and fires, uh, floods and winds and sea level rise in the Florida Keys to its, uh, to its true level, none of the people who work in those industries be able to afford to live there. You know, the, the ultra wealthy can self insure. You know, mm -hmm. if they have their house for the next 20 years, they might be happy or their condo, um, even if it's a total loss down the road. But most people don't have that kind of backstop. And um, already we're seeing um, people migrate from some of the fire zones in California, for instance. Uh, Wired just had an article on this, moving to New England, which is perceived to be safe. And indeed that rhodium study said that New England might be the one place that has positive migration because of, of climate change, because it is better insulated from the aggregate risks than all the other counties in the country. Electric vehicles, they are becoming extremely popular now. So what's your view on those? And, and also could we discuss the kind of flip-flopping a bit like uh, the General Motors where they've gone from supporting EV technology to then going back to, to gas? Well, I, I think, um, well, EVs have expanded far more rapidly than anybody expect, ex expected. And um, one of the reasons is ironic, and that is that the explosion of smartphones um, in the first decade of the 2000s led to extraordinary innovation in battery technology, which led to more efficient and longer lasting batteries extending the range of EVs. And that's one of the tributaries to uh, why they, they become so wildly popular. I think 
$7 gas in uh, California is going to make them even more popular. Now, some of the, uh, the major auto companies um, started work on EVs back in the 90s or even further behind. But I always had the impression that what they were trying to do was prove that EVs were impractical back then. Then, of course, Tesla comes along and has a market capitalization that is larger than all the other auto companies put, put together. It's a tremendous black eye for that industry. And now they're all struggling to get into the business. On the other hand, they, they have mixed motives. I mean, it, I use the analogy, it, it's somewhat like IBM giving away the operating system to Bill Gates. Well, I'm giving away, yeah, making, and, and, and the personal computer um, because they didn't want to jeopardize their, their legacy business, their, the core business. Um, obviously, 95% of all the cars that GM sells are gas powered. Um, and uh, they don't want to kill that business, even as they don't want, they, they want to be in the EV business. And I think that battle is going to be fought, but it's probably going to be won by the EV side in the long run. Um, the uh, money is flowing into it. And the longer they wait in terms of coming out with a low cost EV, the more entrance you'll see into the market. Look at Rivian coming in um, with a huge market cap, I think larger than GM's and basically sold 200 of these pickup trucks, but they're electric pickup trucks and uh, Amazon's gonna buy a ton of them and others are gonna buy a ton of them. Ford owns something like 20 per 10, 10 or 20% of the company. Um, and, and so Ford actually has an investment in, in the EV side through them apart from its own uh, initiatives. But I think the EV thing is, is here to stay and what's going to, what we're going to see happening. Um, the, 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 the limiting factor to my mind right now um, is uh, the uh, build out of uh, charging stations. And uh, you know, there'll be next generation batteries coming along that are going to have even bigger ranges. And you know, I, I think the other thing you know, that militates for EVs and renewables is uh, it sort of came from COVID, which was that many cities around the world for the first time in, in their residents' lives had clear skies. First time COVID uh, shut down New Delhi to the point that there were people who lived in the city who'd never seen the Himalayas. Now they could see the Himalayas off in the distance, same thing in, in China. And so it's a quality of life issue, it's, uh, uh, not just a, uh, uh, a, um, you know, a, a climate change issue. Just to touch back to kind of presidential elections and, and the, the way candidates kind of kind of lobby to be president. So I, I was kind of surprised that uh, John Kerry and Al Gore didn't run with climate uh, on, on their ticket. Did you get a chance to ask them what, why that was? Well, I did. Um, and I, I noticed it. Um, and uh, I know what exactly what was going on, uh, that they were afraid of uh, losing the auto workers union, for instance. Uh, when I, I went up to Gore, I actually wrote an article back during his election saying, tell us who you are, Al Gore, for MSNBC, um, because I couldn't believe that he wasn't mentioning climate change, having sort of lived in that issue throughout his years in the Clinton administration. And afterwards, I came up to him, a guy, and, and he gave a talk at the Beacon Theater in New York. And, and I said, why didn't you do it? And he said, what about the UAW? At least he was honest, you know, he was saying, and their strategists were telling him, you want, this is not a winning issue. Kerry, the same thing. Although um, when I challenged Kerry on it at a, at, a, at a Brookings Institution event, he went ballistic and said, oh, I talked all about climate change. But I defy you to find one account of his campaign, which says he made it a major part of his campaign. He didn't. And the sad thing is his, the strategists were right. Um, look at what happened with Tom Steyer, you know, who uh, spent millions trying to become the candidate of climate change and really got nowhere. Jay Inslee, Washington, former governor of Washington, I think. He did the same thing. For whatever reason, it has not been a voting issue. And that is in part because it has become politicized. And it became politicized in the late 90s um, after the Kyoto Treaty passed and business thought, oh, we can't let this you know, happen. And so they began lots of pouring lots of money into lobbying efforts to paint it as a part of the liberal, liberal agenda. And you know, it was sort of, it captured some of the energy behind the Wallace movement later by Trump which is that uh, these elites want to tell you how to live your life. And, you know, um, Tony Lee Zerowich, the, the great pollster on uh, climate change, you know, has said that it's funny that the denier movement took, took hold most in former colonies of England, all of which cherish the individualistic and don't like top-down instruction. That's Australia, the United States, to a degree Canada. 
Um, and that's where the denier moments are most, uh, movements are most firmly lodged. You know, Europe doesn't have as much of a denier movement in terms of climate change. And they've done actually a lot more to try to address the problem. And the Biden administration in, in the last election, how well do you think they represented the climate issues? Well, they tried. And then, I mean, to me, the most dispiriting moment of the entire election was in the debates when uh, Biden said that, you know, we, we got to end fracking in Pennsylvania and Trump jumped on him and said, you just lost the state. And then his spin is go into furious backpedaling uh, saying, no, no, you know, it will take a long time to get out of fracking. If in 2020, a presidential candidate cannot boldly say we have to do something about fossil fuels. I mean, we're lost because we have to do something about fossil fuels. Um, you know, if, if we don't wean ourselves from them, the earth is likely to wean us from, from the planet. If you look at the projections from now on, you know, even if everybody abided by the Paris Accords, right? Um, temperature rise is expected to be between 2.7 and 3.7 degrees Celsius. That's like eight to 12 degrees Fahrenheit, something in there. Planet hasn't been that hot for 3 million years before the ice ages. And, you know, it's plenty of life back then. There weren't any humans. And it is seriously open to question that if temperatures rise three degrees Celsius between now and 2100, whether agriculture could support 7.8 billion people, much less the 2 billion are going to be added between now and then. And so it, it's not a matter of choice. If people talk about, gee, taking action on climate change will lower our standard of living. Well, climate change will lower our standard of living to the point where it might not be even living. So, I mean, it, it, you choose your poison. And I also disagree, disagree that uh, the transition to a fossil fuel free economy is gonna lower anybody's standard of living. I think between renewables and carbon free technologies, um, it, 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 it can be you know, relatively seamless and even profitable. Um, you could, uh, you know, we didn't, we, the, the, trans, the, the transition from desk phones to handheld phones didn't throw us into a great depression. You know, in fact, probably most people felt no economic consequences from it, even though it, you know, gave a hit to AT&T and the other phone giants. So we'll just move on to, we've got two questions uh, from our viewers. So uh, Jamie Soden asks, uh, how has technology of today changed and how are things, I'm sorry, uh, how has technology of today changed how things were done in the 1970s? Um, well, the, for one thing, the renewables are many orders of magnitudes more efficient. I mean, we reach grid parity. You know, let's go back. When Jimmy Carter came into office, a solar cell was like $100 a kilowatt hour. You know, I mean, it, it enormously incentive. He brought it down by an order of magnitude during his administration. But since then, um, you know, you're now down to pennies per kilowatt hour. It's grid, you know, it, they're, they're competitive with uh, any fossil fuel. Um, wind power is as cheap as any fossil fuel, and there's a promise of new technologies on the horizon, that are, in the near-term horizon, that could produce electricity for a half cent a kilowatt hour. Um, so in, in terms of technology, it was a seesaw pattern from the 70s, as we discussed, where we on again, off again during the Reagan years, on again a bit during the Clinton years, off again during the Bush years. Um, you know, it, there, the... There, there, there was a problem in terms of like uh, consistency for support um, for renewables throughout that era. And, but um, even despite that, um, things have happened. The other thing I think is really interesting is that with the shift in focus to wanting to deal with climate change, some technologies have been dusted off the shelf that have been around forever, but just weren't deployed because coal was so cheap. Um, one of which is, uh, for instance, a group out of MIT um, came up with a way of creating steel, zero carbon steel, um, using um, iron oxide, running electrical current through iron oxide and some other metals. The method was developed by an MIT scientist named Sadaway decades ago. He was thinking of trying to produce aluminum that way. In other words, it didn't require a technological breakthrough. It's just it required a focus on gee, maybe we need to move away from fossil fuels to dust that off. And, and, and that's the case with a lot of technologies. By repurposing existing technologies, we can get a long way to drastically reducing fossil fuel emissions. I'll give you one example, which I think is on the near horizon. And 
that is um, deep beneath the Earth's cleft, not that Earth's uh, surface of the Earth, not that deep, five to 12 miles down, there is this almost for practical purposes, infinite reservoir of heat, 400 to 500 degrees centigrade. It's like a thousand degrees Fahrenheit, right? Um, it's been inaccessible because oil drilling technology only gets you so far. You can go through sedimentary rock, but when you hit the really hard rock down there, it's five to 10 times harder than sedimentary rock. The conventional really can't do it. Again, a group of uh, scientists out of uh, MIT teamed up with some veteran drilling experts from the oil industry. Um, and they are combining the two technologies using a technology um, that was originally developed for fusion research to create high temperature plasmas to actually, it's called millimeter beam wave beam technology. Those beams can be focused and actually vaporize that deep rock, except leading to accessing that deep heat in as little as a hundred days of drilling. And since time is money in, in drilling, you can imagine that once that source of steam is accessible, 60% of uh, US electricity is generated by a steam turbine. If you could drill, you could substitute and retrofit every one of the fossil fuel fired pants in the country if you wanted to. And the cost would be cheaper than what you're getting from uh, uh, natural gas or coal. And so what I'm saying is that's one of the reasons I think this transition doesn't necessarily have to be as painful as everybody is saying. Um, because once you focus our massive innovation talent on the, this problem, these problems get solved. And I'll, I will use the other, I'll, I'll use, let's use the analogy of COVID. Um, it's both a negative analogy and a positive analogy. The negative side is it shows that once an issue gets politicized as COVID did, it's almost impossible to break through because the message is deemed illegitimate. Um, and if people are dying of the disease and don't recognize it real, how are you gonna convince them on climate change? The positive side of the COVID epidemic is that we developed a vaccine in a year where the past va previous vaccine took seven years. You know? And so if in fact you can develop, uh, focus the world's in innovative talents on, on some of these problems, you're gonna be, we're, we're gonna be amazed. We have to do it. We have no choice, uh, given that scenario I said for 2100. We just can't get there. And so we are going to have to take action sooner or later. And I think um, the biggest impediment, of course, is going to be the breaking through the politicization of the issue. Okay, thank you. So Tom Magney asks, uh, what do you see as the edge cases of what the world will be like in 50 years, e.g. heat? and worst outcomes regarding sea level rise, acidification, and agriculture? <laughs> I don't think you want to hear it. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the issue. I mean, where we're heading is a bad enough case without action. In other words, at 2.7 to 3.7 degrees, um, the sea level rise, you know, um, it has exceeded all expectations in terms of the rapidity of which sea level is rising. And also, Go back to 1990, uh, the first IPCC assessment said there was an, uh, an even chance that the ice sheets would get bigger, not smaller. Now we know that West Antarctic ice sheet is collapsing. Greenland is melting far faster than anybody expected. And uh, it's more than 40% of sea level rise. So a lot of the world's coastal cities are going to be, uh, the people are going to have to move out. They, you know, the cap, uh, where Jakarta, it already got major flooding throughout the city. They're going to have to move, uh, you know, in, in Bangladesh, elsewhere. You know, it's 100 million, 10, 150 million people at risk for the expected sea level rise. And it's probably a much larger number than that. Um, the um, acidification of the oceans, we can only hope. I mean, that was one of the ugly surprises of climate change, which is the, the oceans have absorbed most of the... Uh, excess heat and a lot of the carbon dioxide and it forms carbolic acid in the ocean. And of course, then these little tiny things at the basis of the food chain can't make their shells and you get starvation up and down the line. So that is the danger. I mean, there are all these ugly surprises that have come out. Um, but for one of the ones that's uh, very interesting is like what we've seen is an, a great number of hurricanes rapidly intensify from category one to category five in as little as 24 hours. That hasn't happened before. I mean, that, that I don't know that anybody predicted that that would happen, the rapid intensification. The other thing is 
um, storm systems and uh, cold spells, everything else tends to linger. And that has to do with the, like, it, it's related to the, dis the, the disappearing, not disappearing, the de depreciating contrast between the Arctic and the lower latitudes. Without the temperature contrast, the jet stream slows down, it kinks and these storms, like one storm hit South Carolina a few years ago where it was going so slowly that a pedestrian could walk faster than it. And uh, when you have a situation like that, we get these astonishing rainfall potentials. I remember way back in the 70s, there was an article in the New Yorker about some rainstorm that produced 10 inches of rain and it was regarded as biblical and epic. Well, you had something like 60 inches of rain in one of, out of Harvey in one of the Houston suburbs. Just the, and these numbers are coming through storm after storm after storm, 10, 15, 20 inches of rain. That never happened before. That, and so we're getting all these ugly surprises. And you have to hope um, that um, the uh, acidification of the ocean doesn't proceed apace because uh, that jeopardizes the entire food chain. Thank you. So we're down to five minutes and I'd like to hand it over to you if you've got any final remarks that you'd like to make. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to be hopeful. Um, and that is, I, I think, you know, look, we have to be realistic. We're in, we're already in a climate change event. Mm. Climate is already changing. It's going to continue to change. Um, we have to take in that our foot is on the gas pedal. First thing to do is to take it off the gas pedal. And then the next thing to do is put it on the, put it on the brakes. If there is any good news in this, I do think that these transitions can happen very rapidly, that the technologies, once the money is there, and it is, money is flowing into all these things and renewables um, and alternatives, and uh, the, the things can happen spectacularly fast. Um, and uh, we, they have to. Um, the other thing is at the policy side, at the international level, we desperately need um, a universal, action that forces us, every country on the planet, to reduce their emissions. I think that's doable. I propose that in the end of the book. We don't have the time to go into it, but I, I, it can't just be ad hoc and it, and it, and it can't be piecemeal uh, because we saw what happened with piecemeal with China and India, um, mooting all the efforts of every other country. So uh, I do think that we can avoid the worst aspects of climate change but we have to start right now. I mean, we, it, it's, I, everybody is saying that and people say, yeah, well, well, yeah. And then they go back to their lives. We don't have that luxury or we are creating a world that our children, our grandchildren will never forgive us for. Okay, well, listen, thank you so much for uh, writing your book and, and, sharing, and sharing your story today. Your, your work is extremely important. And we wish to thank you for helping us continue our tradition of hosting Enlightened Conversation for 119 years. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye, Andrew.